White, spinning back to the open side. Corey and Bette, off the goal here for Samu, who's quick. Pete Samu, looking for Corey and Bette. Back to Samu. Oh, that is wonderful. That is wild. That is amazing from the Wallaby. Welcome to Pick and Drive Rugby, where the people's podcast is providing a platform for rugby lovers to come together and support the game that is played in heaven. Match reviews, player interviews, quality rugby chat that is consistent and positive. We do it all for you you our dear listeners i'm your host ando with me is mitch and tonight we're going to be heading up or looking through a very fun trivia segment that i prepared super w round three srp round seven reactions and the locker room mitch so much to go through great to have you here very excited let's uh let's just keep going let's let's keep the the momentum moving and let's keep this punchy tonight well, mate, with that in mind, you quickly take us through Super Rugby tipping, and then at the end of it, you need to tell us where you are on the ladder, and then I'll tell us where I'm on the ladder. <laughs> oh, well, people can already see if they're watching us on YouTube that I'm 155th in the ladder. So uh, there's over 300 people currently in the comp, so I'm not doing too badly, really. I'm just below average, I guess you'd say, which I, I'm, I'll, I'm happy with <laughs> where, considering how badly I've been going this year. But the ones at the top, we've got Jojo Rabbit, 36 points in first place, followed by, uh, I think it's S. Blanco or Paul F. in second place on 35 points, followed cr- closely by Fredo Fredo in third place, also on 35 points. Um, so, yeah, well done to all those players and and do and well done on getting those tips in on time. Mate, it's great fun. Really enjoying it. Um, I'm currently sitting 20th, which I think is probably the best I've ever done done in tipping so I'm, I'm very happy right now uh about how this is going turns out if you don't tip upsets then you generally go quite well in tipping what a ridiculous notion <laughs> uh, but with that in mind two quick calls to action number one join our discord channel to be part of the best australian rugby community going around it's really Really easy to uh, be a part of. The link is on any of our social media profiles. So just click on those and the link will take you directly there. And then lastly, please consider going to coffee.com, ko-fi.com slash pick and drive rugby and supporting us with a one-off or monthly payment. Every little bit counts. Thank you. Mitch, should we go straight into the trivia segment? Uh, Let's have a break and then we'll get into the trivia segment on the other side of the little like intro thingy. Oh, mate, I'm very excited to get to the other side of the intro thing. Let's go. (laughs) Move now to the trivia section. And Mitch, I hope you're ready. There are going to be 10 points that you can possibly win within this. And I want you to write down your answers as we go at the end of it. I'll then go through the answers and you can tally up how many points you have. Does that sound good? I uh, hope so. I hate these ones, but we'll <laughs> give it a go. <laughs> we'll give it a go. And as always, uh, ladies and gentlemen, listening on at home or at the workplace, please make sure that you play along too. And before you find out the answers, figure out how many, um, well, once you find out the answers, figure out if you've beaten Mitch or not. And it'd be great to be able to rub it in each week, whoever you're able to beat. So let's start off with, Question one, in which European country is Emily Chancellor currently in? A, England, B, France, C, Spain, D, Greece. Now, you have an answer? A, I've written one down. France, C, Spain, D, Greece. Brilliant. Uh, Question two, who is a new captain for the Eastwood first grade team? No multiple choice. All right. Got that down. Got an answer there? Okay. Yep. Three. What breed of dogs does Tom Wright own with his partner? A. Border Collie. B. Miniature Schnauzer. C. Sausage Dog. D. French Bulldog. So A. Border Collie. B. Miniature Schnauzer. C. Sausage Dog or Dachshund. And then D. French Bulldog. Okay. Okay. Question one, two, three, four. What character does Andrew Kellaway have to play in Mario Kart? A, Princess Peach, B, Cooper Trooper, C, Dry Bones, D, Tanuki Mario. Okay, I did see that. <laughs> I did see that the other day, so I'm feeling confident on that one. 
Brilliant. Okay, <laughs> Got you one. might get a few of these then. Depends. It depends. You might get a few of these. Um, name one of the players that Andrew Killaway lived with when he first started at the Waratahs and was living in, I think it was Randwick or Coogee. Okay. So name one of the players. I do not know, but hopefully. Yep, go. Ooh, okay. I've got one down. Question seven. Which premiership club did Andrew Kelloway move to after leaving the Waratahs? Was it A, Bristol, B, London Irish, C, Exeter, D, Northampton? So Bristol, London Irish, Exeter, Northampton. Cool. I think that was question six, right? Uh, no. Oh, wait. I missed one. <laughs> so, oh, good. Bonus point. Probably going six. To... This one's seven. <laughs> this is going so well. No, no, no. <laughs> going back to it. Um, for the character that Andrew Kelway plays in Mario Kart, for a bonus point, what character does Ando play? Does Ando play? What character do I play? Now, the answers are exactly the same. Princess Peach, Cooper Trooper, Dry Bones, Tanuki Mario. You get one option here. Okay. Okay, so that was question five. Question six was who did Andrew Kilway live with? Question seven was a premiership club that he moved to after leaving the Waratahs. Mm -hmm. Question eight. Nemani Nadolo announced his retirement this week. After leaving the Waratahs, he went to France and then England. Which premiership club did he first play for in 2010-11, that 2010-11 season? Was it A, Leicester, B, Northampton, C, Exeter, or D, London Irish? Leicester, Northampton, Exeter, London Irish. Okay. Nine. At which club does he have the most points scored? A, and this is all clubs that he's played for, okay? A, Green Rockets Tokatsu. So obviously in the top league over in Japan. Okay. B, Montpellier. C, Leicester. D, Crusaders. So out of those four teams, where has he scored the most points? Can you read them again? Green Rockets, Tokatsu, yep. Montpellier, Leicester, Crusaders. Cool. All right. And the last question. What did Quade Cooper and Will Genia both do independently of each other yesterday? Did they A, swim in a waterfall, pool in the mountains and feel cleansed by the calming waters? <laughs> Did they B, meditate on a lookout with views of the Pacific Ocean? C, practice Tai Chi and comment on how they felt more centered afterwards? D, lost themselves in sensory deprivation tanks but found a new perspective on their problems? A through to D. Pool in the mountains, meditating on a lookout, Tai Chi or sensory deprivation tanks. Those are your four options. Do you have an answer for every question that we've put out there, my friend? I do. Not necessarily the right answer, but I do have an answer. <laughs> okay. Let's go back to question number one. Your answer was? I said D, Greece. Unfortunately, incorrect. The answer could have been England or Spain. England, because that's where they probably were, but Spain, because I think they tagged each other in Spain as a joke with Laurie Kramer and... Um, oh. So... Uh, they were definitely in England watching the Exeter men have a game. Right. Next question. Okay. Question two. Who is the new captain for the Eastwood first grade team? Your answer was? Pod favorite, Ed Craig. Pod favorite, Ed Craig. Congratulations, Ed. Question three. What breed of dogs does Tom Wright own with his partner? Your answer was? I said C, sausage dog. D, French bulldog. He's got two Dang. French bulldogs. Four. What character does Andrew Kellaway have to play in Mario Kart? Your answer? Princess Peach. Correct. Bonus Whatever point. that was, I think A. It was A, correct. So cool. what character do I play? I said dry bones. Princess Peach. Oh, dang it. Yep. Every week, uh, every week, every time when I'm playing with my boy, Princess Peach. Gotta be. <laughs> um, <laughs> six, name one of the players that Andrew Kellaway lived with when he started the Waratahs. I said Jake Gordon. That is correct. Well done. Yes. Seven, which premiership club did he move? Did Kellaway move to after leaving the Waratahs? Northampton. Correct. Well done. Who did Nemanja Nadolo first play for in a premiership? Leicester. Exeter. That's Ooh. Leicester. He finished his career, but he had one game in the Anglo, what is it, Anglo Welsh Cup, 
uh, I think it's called. He only played one game for them. Yeah, I think he he played one game uh, in the <laughs> season before he I didn't went know to that. Japan. Um, so he went in. Yeah, he went and played a couple of games in England. No, in France, and he moved over to England for one match and then went to Japan. So very much wow. a journeyman in those earlier stages. Yeah. Uh, question nine: Which club does Nemanja Dolly have the most points scored? I was going to say Crusaders, but then I went with Leicester. Yeah, that would make sense for Leicester. He was there for a long time. It's actually Green Rockets Tokatsu. Um, he spent three seasons there, and I think defense was pretty optional because he, yeah. even though he didn't have the most games played, he clearly had the most points scored. Uh, right, so that makes sense. He very much enjoyed his time there from a goal scoring, uh, try scoring perspective. And then okay, cool. what did Quade Cooper and Will Genia both do independently of each other yesterday? I had no clue, so I went with Tai Chi. Yeah, that would have that, that was a good call. I can see them both doing that. Uh, they went for a swim in a waterfall, water <laughs> waterfall pool in the mountains. Uh, so I basically but not together. No, about twenty minutes after each other. Um, and, wow. Uh, Will Genia saw Quaid when he was arriving, and Quaid was leaving, or vice versa, one of the two. Oh, okay. Um, Are so they anyway. in Australia or is that in Japan? No, it's in Japan. It's in Japan. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, at least I assume... I thought it was in Japan. <laughs> I assumed it was in Japan. So, how many points did you get? I have no idea. <coughs> you counted them up? Four. Four. So, yeah, if you got, got more than so four... Ed Craig... Ed Craig, Princess Peach, Northampton, Jake Gordon. Those are the Princess ones I got Peach, right. Mate. You didn't get Princess Peach. The first one round. You said the Andrew bones. Kellaway one. You said dry bones. No, I said that for you. Oh, okay. All right. I believe you. There's two questions, you. remember? Andrew <laughs> Kellaway's one was Princess Peach and your one was Well awesome. done. Thank you. I forgot that. <laughs> All right. Well, well done. Points on one three then. <laughs> I'm doing as well as my tipping. As well as your tipping. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that was a bit of fun. And why don't we move on now to the matches from this week. And Mitch, you're taking over this section. Fantastic. So we'll start off with uh, the round results for Super W. So this was the third round of the competition for 2023. Uh, we only had three games this week. Actually, I think we only have three games every week. So Super Rugby Pacific, we had a reduced schedule with a lot of buys coming into play. Uh, but for this week, we'll run through the results and then we might talk through some of the games in detail. So the, on Friday night, we had the Reds and the Brumbies. The Reds hosting the game there, taking the victory there 20 to 10 over the Brumbies. We then on Saturday afternoon had the Waratahs and Fijiana in Drua. Waratahs getting a lot of uh, payback over the, the Drua for their victory last year in the Super W final. 31 to 5 was the final score there. Uh, and then we had Western Force and Melbourne Rebels uh, 13 to 5 to the Western Force in that game on Sunday afternoon. Well, actually, no, that was later Saturday night, I think. Um, anyway, Ando, you were, you were out there on. Saturday afternoon at Concord Oval, cheering on the Waratahs women's team. What were your sort of thoughts uh, from that game? Mate, I thought it was an absolutely brilliant game. And I was really surprised how one-sided it was. Uh, I think coming away with a 31-5 to win was kind of maybe beating the expectations that the Tars might have had coming into this match. But I thought it was absolutely fantastic and a really, really great uh, opportunity for them to lay claim to uh, their goals and their intentions and aspirations for this season. What was the sort of atmosphere like at the game? How many people sort of do you think ended up attending? Oh, look, it was it was pretty well attended. Um, if You've been out to Concord Oval? Not, not since it's been re, sort of revamped. Okay, cool. So you've got um on the uh, the near side, the stadium side, the shady side of of the ground. Um, really nice, well made seating. Um, and that was almost full, I would say. And then maybe there was like fifty to one hundred people standing on the other side of the oval out in the sun. But nobody would have been over there because the sun was really low, getting you massively in the eyes. Um, so nobody was standing over there. But in terms of the crowd, it was pretty boisterous. Um, some some really kind of loud family members who are out there to support. I'll be honest and say there probably weren't too many Waratahs fans who weren't direct family members or friends of the players. Yeah. Um, it was, I think, I wonder if, 
yeah, maybe my son and I were probably <laughs> some of the fewer ones who didn't actually directly know a player. But in <laughs> saying that, mate, the, the women played absolutely fantastic. Uh, I thought Piper Duck, again, had a barnstorming match at eight. Even though for a lot of the time off scrums, she's playing from six, her running game is has really stepped up a notch in 2023, particularly her ability to play as a bit of a link player out wide and maintain her feet through the tackle and get out off, get some offloads off was excellent. Um, do you want me to go through a few players that, that performed well or did you want to jump in with a quick comment? Yeah, I, I, I saw bits and pieces of this game. Um, I had it on whilst doing a few other things in the afternoon, wasn't able to actually get out there and attend, unfortunately, but I was really impressed with a lot of the Waratahs girl. I thought, girls. I thought Maya Stewart out on the wing had an absolute incredible yeah. performance. Every time you give her like a centimeter, she makes, she makes a line break. Uh, it was unfortunate for her to come off midway through the second half with a concussion and looked a little bit sort of off uh, on her feet, but um, hopefully she can sort of bounce back from that quite quickly. Yeah, I agree. And Maya Stewart is one of those players that was just immense when she got some space on the wing. Um, I thought that, I think it was Jade Sheridan was a late call-up replacing Georgina Frederick for some reason. Um, not sure why Georgina didn't start, but yeah, Jade Sheridan was excellent. Scored an absolute cracker of a try in the 64th or 65th-ish minute um, where she ran on incredibly well with a bit of width. Um, kind of that, you know that play where the fly half will straighten the line, play it wide, but they'll pass the ball and and the person will actually kind of like turn out towards the sidelines whilst the ball's coming towards them. So they get on the outside shoulder of the defender. It was just it was just brilliant to watch, and she had some real pace to burn. Um, I thought that Ella Ryan was pretty good at 10, but she had a bit of an early knock, which seemed to put her off her game a little bit. And when Claudia Meltzer, the reserve fly half, came on, uh, number 22, she was brilliant at straightening the line and with a strong, strong passing game. Do you see Bradio Gorman's half break, by the way, after Margaret yeah. Bellas? Um, I think that was just brilliant. Again, Brody O'Gorman finding herself in space, bumping over one of the Indruid defenders and then a really nice pop pass, which resulted a couple of phases later for a Land Morgan try. Um, she got a double, actually, in this game, so she was doing really well. Mate, it was just a great all-round performance. Um, Caitlin Hulse, as well, is just bloody fantastic for being 16, year old, 16 years old. Probably the best kicker, I would argue, best um, kicker out of the hand in the Waratahs team. Like she's fantastic. So yeah, really good performances all around. Great to watch. Uh, and the other person I want to quickly shout out, Fee Jones, the number seven, um, is mm -hmm. just an absolute pocket rocket. Just keeps on running the whole game. Um, absolutely loved it. And she just did not stop. Awesome to watch. Really enjoyed the passion and enthusiasm she had. It was great, great to be at the ground and just see those extra efforts and extra movements that players make off the ball. So it was a little bit, uh, for someone who hasn't watched as much Super W as they would have liked this season, uh, I was down there in Melbourne for the final last year and the Fijiana and Drua just took the, the game to another level. And we saw that both times the Waratahs women played them last year, that every time mm. Fiji had half a centimetre or two centimetres or made half a line break, they were away throwing offloads, throwing balls around like crazy, scoring points left, right and centre. It seems like a, comp a different Drua side this year. They don't seem to be as well... Um, connecting in the midfield. They don't seem to be able to be having that dominance in, in the tight like they were last year. Is there, is there something you could sort of highlight as to why that sort of reason was this, this weekend? Well, one of the things that was incredibly noticeable for the, um, I'll, I'll say it from a Waratahs perspective, if that's all right. But one of the things that was really noticeable was the fact that the Waratahs were far more prepared for the style of game that the Drew were trying to bring. Okay. So what that, that means is um, they were far more willing to be drifting with the Drua attack when they were playing it out wide rather than trying to make one-up tackles, um, taking around the legs and then allowing the Drua players to get the offload away and have that really quick continuity of play. Um, so they were able to drift a lot uh, more succinctly, or no, that's not the right word, drift and stay connected as a unit. And then when they did need to make the tackles, they were trying to go up high and wrap the ball and prevent the offload, or they would go low, but then a second person would come in and be kind of in the way for that little pop pass. So that was really noticeable. But also, whenever there was a penalty or something like that, the Waratahs were screaming and yelling at each other to turn and face and to get back the 10 and stay connected. The amount of work they were doing off the ball to make sure that they 
they did not present those broken play opportunities was impressive. But you saw within like the 50th minute of the game, that exertion really start to get to the Tars women. Um, and the Druids started to make a few, have a few more opportunities and make a little bit more of a headway. But yeah, it was, um, honestly, it was just brilliant to, um, a, a brilliant defensive effort. Uh, I guess from the women, I, the Fijiana women, I wonder how much of a turnover there has been. I'm just trying to get up the Indrua um, team list for this weekend, but they don't have it on Instagram. So I'm just quickly getting it up. But Yeah, I, I did read somewhere been, that the Fijiana uh, and Drua have gone through something like between 10 players, like changeover of players in their starting 15 or at least in their 23. Um, this season, I think that's where we're starting to see that there is that um, just the lack of cohesion that we come to expect from teams who have played a lot of game time together. We've got new faces, we've got new players getting their opportunity at this level. This was also the first uh, the first time that Indrua have travelled this year. They've played their first two games in Fiji and had the other teams travel to play them. So I do wonder if the travel element played a factor this week as well. Uh, from the starting pack for the Fijiana team in the final last year, only two of the players are still in the starting lineup for this match. Yep. Um, and then you look at the... Yeah, I'm looking at the back line and hardly any of... Yeah, the back line is entirely different. Yep. There's literally nobody starting in the back line for the... Yeah, okay, cool. So that, that says a lot as well. So they've had huge amounts of turnover um within within their squad so obviously that would be speaking to the disconnection that they're having as a team i do wonder how many of those women have gone across and are, are popping up in the premiership or in france now uh because we had the women's mm. world cup last year and you do often see that that once a world cup cycle finishes the players do sort of tend to go overseas and with the progression of the women's game around the world different opportunities for players this might be that sort of time frame where the the teams are starting to sort of have that turnover which we have s tended to see a little bit in the australian teams as well yeah yeah did you get a chance yeah, to watch any of the other games the this weekend um, uh i've seen the minis for the red Brumbies and rebels force um but not the full games so do you want me to quickly go through those yeah yeah if you, i haven't had a chance to watch much more than the highlights for these ones so if you've you've seen the minis you've seen a little bit more than yep. i have <laughs> well, I think um, considering we're Tars fans, we generally do focus on on the Tars, but the Reds, it was really good to see them get up over the Brumbies. I would have thought the Brumbies were probably um, going to, yeah, push them a little bit further, although it obviously wasn't a blowout with 20 to 10. But it's good to see um, some of the intent from the Reds like they've spoken about in that um, kind of docu-series that they've got that's running at the moment um, talk about how they really want to be building their fitness within latter parts of the game and that really came to the fore here so the reds will be quite happy with that performance um the rebels losing to the western force the force were really good for this win i thought that was really impressive for them um they had a lot of pay coming out of their forward pack as well and i think the rebels have really been uh struggling to basically get the continuity between like the forwards actually playing together tight as a unit seems that all players maybe don't have the strong idea of um where they're needing to be at different points of the game that's quite noticeable watching it uh but also players were playing within the back line just a bit like one out or just playing what they saw in front of them without trying to play phases in order to manipulate and then unlock the defensive line so a lot of improvement to go there but yeah, the Western Force will be really, really happy to come away with the win. And I did see the the, the Reds and Brumbies game was called off with lightning uh, in the second half. Did it, course, did it end yeah. up resuming at all? Or was yeah, it just completely yeah, yeah, abandoned? Yeah. No, no, no. It was it was because um, that's why they have a result because they were able to finish the game. Otherwise, it's right. um, it's not a result. So yeah, there was lightning stri lightning strikes within five kilometers of the field. So yeah, they needed to pause the game for thirty minutes, and I think it ended up being about forty five to an hour that they had to pause the match for. 
Um, but either way, yeah, it was it was a good game, leaving the Brumbies uh, scoreless along with the Rebels at the bottom of the ladder, although the Brumbies do actually have a bonus point. So it puts the Waratah women out in front on 15 points with uh, three bonus points to their name. So they have the Queensland Reds chasing after them uh, with three wins as well and two bonus points on 14, then drew it on nine. So it makes this weekend's match on Sunday, the Reds versus the Waratahs at Concord Oval um, in Sydney at 3.05 p.m. is going to be the top of the table clash, an absolute cracker. I'm pretty disappointed I'll be out of town, so I won't be able to be there. <laughs> yeah, I expect this one to be a, a grand final preview, um, the way the things are sort of shaping up so far this season. Yep, yep, very keen, very, very keen. So, yeah, if you awesome. can get out, ladies and gentlemen, get to that game. It'll be great to watch, but... Um, yeah, I really enjoy going out. And just quietly, the uh, the beers at Concord Oval, incredibly affordable. Like, incredibly yeah. affordable. So don't drive or get someone else to be your designated driver. Um, and Or come up with a plan B, as they say. But yeah, enjoy yep. the opportunity and have a couple of babies. Awesome. No, that sounds great. Well, shall we move across now to the results for Super Rugby Pacific? So for round seven, we only had four games this week with the other teams getting the first buy. I know from a fantasy perspective, that caused a bit of chaos in terms of drafting players and being able to fill up a full squad, but um, we, we we got through it. There is a lot of questions that I have seen floating around social media, and maybe we'll talk about it a little bit more in the locker room later. But to start off with, Andrew, did you think it was a bit of an, a missed opportunity by Super Rugby to not have more games available on this Easter long weekend? Oh, uh, look, there's two ways of looking at it. One, yes, it's a missed opportunity because a lot of people um, might be at home, might have the opportunity with a long weekend to be able to go to games. The alternate view is with so many people going away for holidays, it's the first weekend of the school holidays, a lot of people do go away in this time. Uh, crowd attendance is pretty low. So you saw that with a few of the um, matches this weekend, like the Reds home game was really poorly attended. Uh, again, the weather was bad. But weather combined with school holidays can't be a good combination. And so I just wonder if it might have been a bit of a, uh, a good choice. Personally, I think it's a good choice to not have that many games this weekend. But that's my perspective. What do you think? Yeah, I'm, I'm on, that on that train as well. I think a lot of people are sort of saying that I think the NRL had eight games across the weekend and, and a lot of them on primetime TV with people at home or at family functions, the opportunity is there to watch the games. AFL as well had full games being played across the round. Super Rugby then has a reduced format, two games each day, only four games over the weekend. It sort of feels like there was a missed opportunity in terms of getting our content out there. But when you actually look, like you said, uh, at the attendance of the games, pretty poorly attended across all games this weekend, regardless of where they were played and when. So... Um, I think from a broadcaster's perspective or even from the organizer's perspective, it's probably easier to have less games on when people aren't going to attend uh, in terms of just having people see at home and watching. So I can see, I guess that's, that's why that happened, but let's, um, let's get into the results for the weekend. So the first game was between the Crusaders and Moana 38 to 21 in that game. We then had the Reds and the Brumbies 24 52 in that game to the Brumbies. Uh, did I say the Crusaders won that first one, 38 to 21? They did anyway, if, you, if you're not following along on, on YouTube and, and can see the results in front of us. Third game of the weekend was the Highlanders hosting the Hurricanes, 29-14 to the Hurricanes in that game. And then the final game of the weekend on Saturday night, the Rebels hosting the Blues in Melbourne, 54-17 in that one to the Blues. Now, the first thing I need to say, Ando, for this round is I think I have come up with a reason why the Aussie teams aren't going so well. And I need to put my hand up. I think it's me. I've thought that for a while. So what's your... what's your? So what's this your game, uh, this weekend, I had the opportunity to turn into, I think, three of the games at halftime. And at halftime, the team, it was like upsets across all three games. The Moana were winning against the Crusaders. The Rebels were up against the Blues. And I think the Highlanders were close with the Hurricanes when I turned that one on. And then I started watching the second half and the, the predicted teams ended up smashing it in. So I think I need to put my hand up and say, it's me, guys. I'm the problem. And uh, I need to just either stop watching or I don't know what, but I'm the one that's causing these the scores to go the other way. 
Mate, you're as body bad as um, fan of the pod and pod favorite Simo, who on Discord, whenever he tunes into the chat and starts supporting another team or supporting a team, they immediately start losing. Okay, so he's banned from supporting the Tars moving forward, although he is a Force fan. So I think <laughs> together with the two of them, with, with you, you guys just aren't allowed to watch Australian rugby games anymore. Okay, you're banned. Um, but I would agree. I mean, if we start with the Crusaders versus Moana, it was a case of um, Moana actually doing quite well within the first half, but then as has been the case for them, they compete well for 50, 60 minutes of match and then fall away at the end. So Dallas McLeod and then Willie Hines scoring try, 62nd, 79th minute. Um, really, it's just emblematic of the fact Moana cannot stay in touch with teams into the second half. And it's not just Moana's. It, it is a, a, a trend of Moana's season at the moment. It's something that they're not able to arrest and to sort of get that ascendancy back against teams. But we did see it a lot across this round. I can't remember the halftime result in the Reds and the Brumbies, but all other the other two games at halftime, it was like three within three points. Um, it was really tight, and it only blow out towards the end of the games. Mm, yeah, the halftime score was something like seventeen nineteen or seventeen twenty one. Yeah, the Rebels were up seventeen to like fourteen. Um, 17, I think it was against the Blues. Oh, um, sorry, Highlanders and Hurricanes. All oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. All oh, right, sorry, yeah. Keep going, keep going. Highlanders, uh, Hurricanes. Highlanders, Hurricanes was like seven to eight or something, or eight five at half time. So it was a really tight score in that game as well. Uh, and yeah, all three games, all four games across the round, we sort of started to see that in the second half, teams weren't able to keep up that momentum. Whether that comes down to the law variations that we've seen this year. The fatigue elements start to come in. We'll talk a little bit about that Rebels game in detail in a little bit. And injuries is definitely a, a theme in that game. But we're starting to see that whilst mm. teams are able to sort of be up and start and, and stay with their opposition for the first 35, 40 minutes, when it comes out of that halftime break, the other teams tend to, the ones that have that ability to take it to another level often do. And um, they start to accelerate yeah. away from their yeah. opposition. Yeah, it just shows the the gap between the, the the top tier teams and then the next rung down. And so you saw that really clearly with the Highlanders and the Hurricanes. Like the Highlanders have had a couple of better results over the last couple of weeks, better performances than earlier in the season with a few players coming back from injury and the like. But then going up against one of the better New Zealand teams, it was just, yeah, obvious how much of a gap there was i mean the highlanders got a try in the last couple of minutes of the game to billy harman but before that it was 729 and there was no way that the highlanders were getting back into this match so yep. yeah there's there's a real gap between the top kind of four or five teams and the rest of the competition definitely now if we move now into the the australian games and particularly the first one which was the derby against the reds and the brumbies I think we can't go much further without talking about this game to discuss the the yellow slash red card that happened in the ninth minute of the game. It's all over social media. Depending on where you come from, what color jersey you wear, is what sort of state you think the outcome of this should have been, what were your initial thoughts around the way that this was adjudicated? I thought it was perfectly fine and the laws and the rules worked. The, the super rugby variations that have been brought in for this season worked absolutely perfectly and it did what it was intended to do. Oh, that's not fun. I, I, that's my <laughs> stance. You needed to get angry, Ando. You need to come in and say oh. it needed to be an out, outright red. He needs to not play rugby again ever. It's like well, some of the, I, the hot takes going around. Yeah, well, why don't I jump into that then? Because I really enjoyed this. Um, what are they? What's the group called that does the that's really concerned about like high high tackles? Like the player welfare rugby. concussion group. Rugby. Yep. 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 Um, so Progressive Rugby put out a tweet just saying madness with the clip of um, the the attempted tackle tool then kind of jelly legs on his feet afterwards, clearly seriously injured and hurt and concussed from the impact that he'd had. Um, 
And they, they just said madness. And then when I saw this, maybe an hour or two after it had been posted, everybody in the comments, because Progressive Rugby, I, I'm pretty sure a UK-based um, yeah. account, they everybody in the comments was like, this is a joke. How does that a yellow card? Super Rugby is just disgrace, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and I responded with, people in these replies don't know the rule change for Super Rugby. If foul play meets the threshold, yellow card is issued, then TMO reviews whilst, con whilst play continues, upgrades to red is required, blah, blah. Blah, blah 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 i got bloody so many likes and stuff this is probably the most popular tweet i've ever put out there <laughs> i don't know you had some controversial ones on the podcast channel as well <laughs> yeah but but back to that podcast, south africa yeah. game last year <laughs> <laughs> anyway um anyway this wasn't even me being like angry and fishing or anything like that it was just me saying like no you need to know the rules so yep. what people seem to be arguing is that it should have been a straight red because of the um level of danger within the tackle so i can i can guess i can understand that but i mean from my perspective the law variations they're meant to be focusing the, the modified process that is allowed is that if the um that they're able to issue a red full a full red card for deliberate foul play in which case the player will not return to the field and cannot be replaced i think it's probably expecting a lot from the referee in that tackle instance to make the call that it's a deliberate foul play clumsy mm -hmm. and reckless without a shadow of a doubt but deliberate I think might be a bit of a stretch to say that Angus Angus Blythe deliberately headbutted him and caused him to have that injury. What do you think? Do you think is there was a deliberate attempt to have a head clash? No, I don't. I don't agree that it's a deliberate attempt. I have seen some people out there that have sort of started to talk around outcome and intention in this, and I don't think that should be brought into the sort of process. Um, I think there's a lot. There is a little bit of grey area. I will grant that in this adjudication process whether whether you want that outright red card given or you give the yellow that upgrades to a red. I think the difference is, if I'm not mistaken, an outright red card is like an old-fashioned red card. The player doesn't get replaced. Correct. Correct. Yep. If a yellow card is upgraded to red, it's the 20-minute red card, so the team ends up getting a player back. Correct. Now, Correct. I think there is a big difference in... Um, penalty i guess to the team that cops an outright red card as opposed to an upgraded yellow card and i think we need to reserve those that outcome for instances that are obvious and intentional like a punch an eye gouge a bite um, a squirrel grip those sorts of things that we want to stamp out of our game mm -hmm. completely uh, an error in judgment in trying to make a tackle yep. is not in my opinion enough of an outcome to have that effect on the game, particularly when you consider that it was a ninth minute. Yeah, especially like if you read the um, rules, uh, the, the variations and modified play process, which I'm directly reading from the Super Rugby website, uh, it says the possible sanctions are once the player's left the field. Um, the red card sanction, which a player would be removed from the match but would be permitted to be replaced after 20 minutes, has to be made if foul play is evident and determined to be deliberate and with a high level of danger. That's the thing. So there is definitely a high level of danger without a shadow of a doubt, but I think the sticking point is whether you claim it is deliberate or not. And I'm not convinced that there's enough uh, evidence to say it was deliberate I would say, again, like I said before, reckless and careless. Um, and I think Bernie Larkham, after the game, was very um, charitable when he said that, well, you sometimes get these things with locks running through or second rows running through. They're just a bit unco, aren't they? A bit lanky. A bit lanky, a bit unco, and everybody just laughed and was like, yeah, I kind of get it. Um, he didn't, Angus Blythe didn't mean to. He's never shown that type of attitude or um past behavior previously i mean yeah anyway anyway he'll be i think the big the that, most interesting uh, thing that will come from this is the the judicial panel the review that comes in the in the coming days yeah, and whether he ends up yeah. getting because that they'll decide then whether they deem this was this met the outright red card threshold or not hmm. and then that'll set a precedent moving forward i personally don't think that uh Blythe was intentionally trying to do it but i do agree that it was reckless and it was incredibly dangerous he made no attempt to lower his body height in trying to charge the ball down. And he made it worse by ducking his head at the last minute in a way to sort of shield himself from the ball. But it ended up 
connecting head on head with Tool, and um, the outcome was just horrible. Uh, you could see he's, he was angry as soon as he went off the field from, from the way that he was doing it. It was just like his return after a few weeks injury or, or just non-selection. So it's not yep. the kind of thing you want to be doing. But at the same time, like the outcome was so harsh and Tool doesn't come back. He fails the HIA. But again, we can't, find, we can't as a game, move into that, yep. that process of adjudicating on outcome. If it didn't end up being as bad, he still hits him high, but he doesn't make contact with his head and Tool gets up and plays on. Is everyone happy with the yellow card? Uh, I don't know. That's what. That's a completely different scenario that we're talking about. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, why don't we move forward um, into the, moving other on. Of the game then? This yeah, was moving on. The, really the final score, 52 match. to 24. Do you think that's a fair reflection on, on the overall game? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, the Reds were really poor in the second half in all honesty, and they probably didn't deserve to come much closer. Um, maybe that final try to Nick Frost was um, a bit of icing on the cake and made it look a bit worse. It's it's pretty different, the score being 24 to 45 and 24 to 52. There's something about bringing up the half century, raising the bat to the crowd that's pretty uh, humiliating in some ways, letting in 52 points. But yeah, I think that the, the Brumbies were good for this win. It's, um, I personally didn't think the Reds were as bad as the scoreline suggests. I think they were in it for a long period of time and they just weren't able to sort of finish off a lot of things that they, they had the opportunity, they found themselves in space or they made a line break and they ended up knocking it on or not finding the man. And it was frustrating from uh, an Australian rugby perspective, really, that we're sitting here watching a team like this that has so many talented players not able to uh, e- execute at their fullest. Mm. Um, everyone's talking at Michael Atkinson after the game. Everyone interviewed, he was talking about Wallaby selection or non-selection. Was this on your mind? Is this a reason why you were playing so well or you weren't playing so well? Uh, I think one thing that sort of jumps out to me in this game when you reflect on it is, and similar in some ways to the Waratahs, or is that it seems like it's a team of individuals playing individual games. Take McDermott scoring individualistic tries, doing really, really well himself but not applying a lot of pressure. The Brumbies, on the other hand, are, are doing the complete opposite. They're building pressure. They're working as a pack. Mm-hmm. They're scoring tries and they're scoring points through that that sort of emphasis together. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting way of looking at the game. I mean, the stats tell a really interesting story in that from a defensive point of view, uh, the, the Reds defensively were better in that they had 88% tackle success to 81%. Um, they did have, uh, they conceded more clean breaks, but they also beat nearly double the defenders. Um, than the Brumbies. So the Reds obviously were doing some things well within their attack and their defense. I thought there were a few players that did have good games. Jordi Pattaya was excellent. Tate McDermott was really strong. Harry Wilson had a few early issues with his handling, but the conditions were horrific. It was like pouring with rain the whole game. Um, and the Brumbies conceded 15 turnovers to seven throughout the match. So that was really significant. But then the error penalty rate for the Reds 15 penalties compared to nine for the Brumbies. Their their capacity to give away penalties regularly is becoming more and more of an issue for them throughout the season. And it was really interesting after the match to see how much, um, like Brad Thorne knows he's a dead man walking. He will be gone at the end of the season. Um, he, he knows it. Uh, but the... It's an interesting question as well to ask whether he'll actually make the end of the season or whether they'll pull the pin early. But Liam Wright was basically saying, look, we just need to be better as players. The fact that Brad is copying so much flack as the coach when he's preparing us well and we're not the ones executing out in the field, we need to be taking responsibility and ownership for this as well. So it's an, it's an interesting perspective and good to see. Um, I guess the captain can't say anything else, but it is still just <laughs> good to see the um, way in which the players are looking to own the improvements that are needed. When you talk about discipline and that the and you highlight that the Reds gave away 15 penalties, the Brumbies conversely gave away nine. This was their mm. first yellow card conceded in 2023. This is the wow. first card that the Brumbies have conceded this year. And so that goes to show the type of gameplay that they're playing and the discipline and the way and style that they're just not giving away consecutive penalties like other teams are willing and, and doing consistently. 
Yep. Um, and uh, I mean, we've spoken about it from the start of the season, but the Reds front row is still struggling. Um, like Dane Zander is getting out muscled a bunch at the scrums. He conceded four penalties within this match, which he'll be really disappointed with on a personal personal level. And I think that the team is just there seems to be something missing in terms of the in tight carrying. I think having Seru Uru having to play at um, lock for the majority of the season when he's really six is really concerning. The fact that Luke Jones hasn't even taken a field so far, we're half, nearly halfway through the season, is concerning. Like, where's where's Luke Jones? Where's the injury update for his return back into the game? Um, and now having Blythe out again after being injured for the first part of the season, um, they're really just struggling with the engine room of their forward pack. There's one solution to the problems that the Reds find themselves in, and that's that Brad Thorne needs to step away from the coaching role and just put the suit, the, the boots back on and, and you know pull on the Queensland jersey and pack down in the second row. I think the mongrel that he alone will bring and the emphasis of the do as I do and and you know the morale that'll bring to the team it's going to spur them on to victory it's the only it's the only way now really yep yep well who knows he'd probably be better than half the option that's actually that's probably not fair but he'd, he'd bring something to the team wouldn't he this mongrel and this aggression uh and this kind of follow me this measured aggression yeah measured measured aggression um so mate i don't know this game's this game's a hard one in that there were a few moments of brilliance from the Brumbies, but at the same time, they were just clinical in the way that they were manipulating the Reds' defense. And once they, like a couple of times, they've gone for a mall, the mall's broken down, and then they've passed it wide from the base of the rock, like as the Reds are on a defensive line, and they've cut out two or three players to then isolate the Reds' defenders and prevent them from getting a wrap around, like the forwards having to run further to wrap around further. And both Lonergan and White have that wide passing game that will enable them to be able to do that really effectively. So it just means for the Reds that they couldn't get the players around, and that's why you had so many wide tries to players like um tom wright early on within the game i think tomani Tua got a try pretty wide as well yep. like it was just great to see the way in which they were able to make those manipulations of the reds day i don't think there's enough talk around this brumbies team at the moment that these guys are really starting to form as as the real deal this year they've yeah. played consistently well all season and bar that game against the crusaders where they rested most of their well all of their wallabies and and a few others they they didn't look bad in that game either. It was just, I think, a tactical decision to take the the rest weeks at that time. I can see this team going all the way this year. They'll make the final. They've shown when they played against the Blues in New Zealand that they are capable of playing a different game plan against the Kiwis. Um, and I think we need to start, as Australian rugby fans, getting behind this team because they are starting to play really good footy. They're not just scoring points through malls as Brumbies teams have in the past. They've got some really exciting wingers. Their centers are looking absolutely on fire. And yeah, they're doing really, really well. Yep. And they've got a pretty good run over the next few games. So they've got the Drua at home, then Canes away, Rebels away, Highlanders at home, Force away, Chris, uh, Chiefs at home, Rebels at home. So out of those, they would be expecting to beat the Drua run the Hurricanes close, if not beat them, but let's just say beat the Drua, beat the Rebels, beat the Highlanders, beat the Force, beat the Chiefs at home, and beat the Rebels at home. So that's six games out of their two, four, six, seven. Six games at the at the worst five, and they'll be coming home incredibly strong with that, with that fixture um, list. So, yeah, really, really keen to see how the season matches out for them. And maybe I'll become a Brumbies fan for the rest of the season. Who knows? you got to get that Ryan Lonigan jersey sorted, mate. Oh, dude. I do. And the uh, full face, full face poster as well. Yeah, we need okay. to get on. We'll get but, on that. If anyone, yeah, look, if anyone really listening well. does have access to a full giant head of Ryan Lonigan that they'd like to donate to the pick and drive cause, please do get in touch. <laughs> That would be absolutely brilliant. So let us know, mate. Let us know. All right, let's move to the other Aussie game of the weekend, and that was the Rebels and the Blues down in Melbourne. So final score, 54-17. Now, as much as I hate to say it, a game of two halves is is no other way but to describe <laughs> this game. 
the Rebels did so well. They were 17 to, I think, 14 or, or 15 at halftime. They scored right on halftime to get that lead. And then in the second half, just everything that could go wrong did go wrong, and the Blues just showed their class and absolutely ran away with it. Yeah, it was, oh, what's the maths? 41 unanswered points. Uh, six tries, so tries to Finlay Christie, uh, two to Finlay Christie, two to Mark Talea, one to offer to Uma Farsi and then Zan Sullivan, all within the second half. Oh, and Dalton Papali'i as well, all within the second half, like an absolute shellacking. But, okay, this entire commentary and discussion of the game needs to be prefaced with the fact that by the end of the first half, the Blues were, the Rebels were down both of their hookers and Sam Talakai was forced to go into hooker for the rest of the game, all of the second half. Yeah, 40 half. minutes. And yeah. yeah, it just basically meant that lineouts, they barely won any of their lineouts within the second half. Scrums were, they were getting pushed off their own ball. It was, it was pretty dire within those parts too. Um, so they just weren't able to secure any ball. So the possession and territory stats are crazy. 66% possession and 61% territory. Um, 838 meters run within the game. Like that's absolutely insane numbers. So yeah, it was a really difficult game for the Rebels. And it's almost like they almost just need after this game to just forget about the second half and go, before we had our set piece just completely decimated by losing both of our hookers we were in this game and we were beating them and there's something that we have to take away like that's surely the only message they can take away i think the only takeaway that comes out of this game really for the rebels is that jordan ulessi can't be a bench spot how mm. often has this guy come on and got injured like this it, yep. he's just showing at the moment that there you can't as a coach have faith in him to do his job coming off the bench you just can't risk it the game was pretty soundly lost on the fact that he got injured and came off at halftime. He played like 15, 14, 13 minutes by that point when he came off injured. And, and what as was it a knee, did his well, Murphy came knee. off with a knee injury, and I think he yeah did an ankle. No, Murphy or... was hand. Murphy was hand injury. Hand, sorry, yeah, hand, and then yeah, knee or ankle or lower leg somewhere. Um, but from what I heard today, he's been cleared for any sort of extended injury and he should be back next week mm, mm. well yeah look it's it's a tough one because that comment is saying nothing about you the person because i mean the fact that he stayed out on the field to throw that line out in a 40 second minute like the extra he like hopped the to the mall <laughs> over time of the first half definitely he hops to the mall like he he couldn't he could barely walk he could barely stay up and yet he threw through that ball and then tried to help the team out. So like definitely not about his no. um, bravery and willingness to kind of put himself out on the line for the team, but he's such a glass cannon in that he's such a capable player, but he just can't keep himself fit and out on the field. Kind of like Pony Farmer silly mm -hmm. or what Jordan Pataya was in 21 and 22. So it's really concerning and it's got to be something. I mean, we're going to see a return of Anaru Rangi next week, which would be great. Love that guy. Yep. So very, very keen to see him get a run. But it's it's a hard one because what do the draft boys call him? The prince that was promised, or they yeah, used the, to call yeah, him that? yeah, that's it. Um, it. It's always that idea of he's always had this talent, but he's he's never been able to be fit consistently enough to demonstrate that talent and ability. And unfortunately, we saw the worst example of what his injury prone nature can result in. Which it's obviously not his fault, but it's just a result of what happened. And the frustrating thing for the rebels too is that they were playing well up into the half. They were in the game. They were yeah. holding the Blues out. I mean, the Blues did take it to another level in that second half, and Bowden Barrett just had a field day. But with a full 15 fit, able to to complement each other, they've shown so far this season that they are able to to match the top sides in this competition, which, as we said earlier in the, in the pod, not all teams can. Um, and it is, I guess, as a Rebels fan or for Rebels fans, frustrating that, they weren't able to push the Blues as close this week. One thing I think we also have to be aware of, that as much as the scoreline flat as the Blues, it could have been a lot worse. Bowden Barrett only got three conversions <laughs> yep. from his nine. Missed six of his conversions. Exactly. So that's like, yep. that's a lot of, that's a whole lot more points that they could have been ahead by. Yep. Yeah, completely agree. And so 
for the Rebels, when you look at their season as a whole, um, they've had some really interesting performances and some opportunities where they've shown a clear development as a team for where they are, where they were in 2022. And I'm really keen to see if we can get in touch with um, some of the coaching staff or um, higher ups within the Rebels outfit to talk to them about the pathways that they're trying to put in place and the way that they're trying to structure themselves as an organization to try and put themselves on the front foot. Because for a long time, I haven't really had a clear idea of what it is that the Rebels are trying to do or who they are trying to be, mm. but it seems like they're getting more of an understanding of their identity as a rugby club, particularly the way they're building into the Pacifica culture down, or Pacifica community, I should say, down yep. within Melbourne and within the subbies clubs throughout Melbourne. So they're an interesting team. This result, it's almost you kind of have to just forget about it because of yep. the context around it. Um, the boys were just too good and were able to exploit the fact that the Rebels just didn't have a set piece and there's not much more to this game than that. One thing, one final thing we'll touch on before we jump into the locker room. Uh, the jerseys that the Rebels were wearing, they were awesome. So this was their like Pacifica cultural jerseys, Indigenous Pacifica, all of the different variations that were represented in that jersey. It looks awesome. I, I would love to see this incorporated into their kind of away kit for 2024. I think that would be fantastic mm. to see in Super Rugby the incorporating that co those kinds of Indigenous designs um, into the home or the away kit so we don't have to have specific rounds for it. We can just have it incorporated into the, the norm. That would be awesome. Yeah, brilliant. Good idea. Awesome. Well, let's, uh, let's dive into the locker room now and uh, we'll answer the fans' questions. All right, we're moving now to the locker room. And this is a part of the podcast where we get to chat and talk through your questions, comments, and banter that you have sent on our social media platforms. So to start with, Mitch put out a post on our on the locker room, which had these questions. What were your thoughts on the yellow slash red card from the um, Reds game? Which is the form Aussie side of SRP 23? And did anyone prove Eddie Jones wrong? So starting with that, Hugh Tyndall has said the 20 minute red, don't get how some people think it was the most heinous incident since Richard Lowe was playing. Um, I'm going to quickly go through the others that have spoken about the red card, and then we'll see what you think, Mitch, in response to those points. Harry Dale has yep. said the card was correct and dealt with quickly and well. Not sure there is much argument about that. So those were the... Um, oh, and Scrumbags, Lockie from Scrumbags has said, not sure why everyone's blowing up about the yellow red decision. The process has been set up to speed the game without compromising the decision-making pro process and it worked perfectly in this instance. Right call, red card issued. So, Mitch, it seems like the people from our network seem to be agreeing with this. Uh, why do you think we've got such a diversity of outrage across other accounts and platforms? Or is that just the way Twitter works? I think, well, it is definitely the way Twitter works, but I think it comes down to the player that ended up getting injured like Corey tools one of the brumbies best this year and had it yep. been someone else like had it been uh reverse jordan pataya copying that max jorgensen uh bryce hegarty for the for the force like um those are the carter gordon potentially for the rebels those are the players that are so integral to the success of the team that it it feels harsher as a fan to get to lose that player so early on in the game and so I think a lot of that just comes from that frustration of the fact that Cool Tool was off for the rest of the game and they weren't able to use him where they still were able to bring a player on after 20 minutes. It wasn't Angus Blythe, but it was a replacement. Yeah, yeah. All right, fair enough. So in response now to the uh, second part of the question, focusing on kind of the form of the different teams, Hugh Tyndall says, it's Brums, then Daylight, then Tars, then Rebs, Reds, Force. And that's generous, also... Hugh. <laughs> that, is, generous. that is generous to you. Um, we'll get to that in a second. Harry Dale has said, Brumbies by a landslide as a form side. Picking next best is where it gets hard. I'll go Tars only because their last hit out was so good. Um, Nick Wasilio said, feel like the form Aussie side is an easy one. However, the issues with the other four franchises are far more concerning. What do the Tars force Reds and Rebels? Uh, why do the Tars force Reds and Rebels seem so behind? 
Uh, and then Scrum Bags has said, form Aussie side is clearly the Brumbies. Massive statement win, but McDermott was superb. So looking at those, your comments then on kind of the form sides within and kind of where everybody else is in response to that? Yeah, I still think the Rebels are the second Aussie side at the moment. They've shown that they are able to match the top teams, take away the second half this week. They've been able and they perform well. They beat the Waratahs. They they pushed the Hurricanes and had they had a full complement, they probably pushed the Blues a lot closer this week. So, um, yeah, I've, what I've seen so far from the Rebels, I've liked more so. The Tars' last game against the Brumbies was impressive but they need to back that up this week where I think the Rebels have backed it up week on, week out this season. Yep, completely, completely agreed. So then moving into the other comments that have been coming through about the players that might have changed minds or not. Um, Q Tyndall has said, not enough to change Eddie's mind. The Reds got smashed, not helping Tate or Wilson's efforts. Like we mentioned earlier, I thought Tate was pretty damn good within this match. Uh, Harry Wilson, a few issues with handling early on, probably tainted the performance a little bit. Um, the Rebels are all injured, so that might change <laughs> Eddie's mind. Um, <laughs> And then Scrum Bags is also, or Lockie has also said, McDermott was superb and probably should have the gold 21 jersey wrapped up. Um, and he has asked a follow-up question, which we'll get to later. So, What are yeah, your thoughts probably... on that? Does does uh, does McDermott get that 21 or do you still think that your boy Lonigan is ahead of him? I think currently my boy Lonigan is probably ahead of him just in terms of I think he's a bit of a safer player at international level in terms of his kicking game is better, his passing game is better, his running game's not bad, and defensively he's quite strong, whereas Tate is clearly above the other contenders in his running game. Um, and we saw that uh, on, I guess, the Brumbies on the weekend. So, yeah, I think it's, it's a really close run thing. Like, Jake Gordon has a good second half of the season. He's still in the picture for that 21 jersey and being a third third scrum half on a plane so it's it's really really interesting to see how that pans out and it's great that we have four top scrum halves one of them clearly better than the others but then three that are great contenders and fighting out for that um, second and third spot yep yep um okay let's go back up to the top then and we do have a couple of other questions first one kick the ref and the ghoulies anybody else tired of the narrative of this competition same year after year kiwis are winning brumbies are good and every other australian team is garbage blow it up go and all aussie comp um absolutely love the passion and the suggestions here there's a <laughs> part of me that just loves the idea of kind of burning the entire australian rugby ecosystem down to the ground and then restarting it in a far better structured manner so i would love to see that happen but it's not going to so mitch are you tired of the narrative of this competition i am but i don't know what we can do differently like we we rely on new zealand so dominantly to play against that we we probably can't sustain the minute market share that we have in the australian sporting landscape if we only do our own thing week in week out we did see that the results were better in terms of viewership and and sort of morale and interest when we had super rugby au but i don't know if that interest continues um through the seasons if we do it more than once or twice like one or two seasons i feel like by season three or by year three we're just going to be so uncompetitive with anyone else in world rugby the wallabies will just get smashed every time we play anyone that it's sort of counterintuitive that fans want to see the wallabies win firsthand but like first is that that's their priority and then they want to see a dominant super rugby sides. Mm, yeah, I really it, it, I really agree with that and there's probably not much more we can be doing. The other fear I have but too is if we blow one, everything up, oh yeah, that I feel like we'll actually and alienate the the few fans that are clinging on. Like if they blew everything up and the Waratahs were disbanded, the Brumbies and the Reds and we started up with two Sydney sides and two Brisbane sides and did something completely new. I don't know how many people would still want to engage in that product and just use this as an excuse to be like, well, I was a Waratahs fan, so now the Waratahs don't exist. I'm just going to go and watch AFL or League. I wonder how many people we lose in that process, which we really, we can't be afford, we can't afford to be losing people at the moment. Yep. Yep. I hear that as well. Um, maybe, I think one of the really interesting things was like, you know, during the COVID period, how... Um, 
Morg and Tira Nui and Ben Kimber were talking so often about the idea of this being an opportunity to change the structure and change the way that things were done within Super Rugby. Uh, but realistically, that just hasn't happened. We've just got kind of the same competition, uh, the same kind of general structure and approach. Cool, we've got two new teams, which are actually better uh, from a from at least a Drew perspective, a, a more well considered and well established, but better yeah, engaged as well like with we fans. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like we just haven't capitalized on opportunities that the COVID forced break provided us with. But maybe that's a discussion for another time. Um, the only last thing then, I would say, and the, before we move on, sorry, uh, is we just need to introduce a draft. That's the outcome that's going to fix all the problems. If we had a competition wide draft system where anyone can play for any Super Rugby Pacific team and still be considered for the All Blacks and the Wallabies. I think that goes a long way to balancing the competition, to weakening the strengths of the New Zealand sides and bringing up the competitiveness of the Australian sides. If you've got players like Bowden Barrett and Richie Moe playing for the Brumbies and the Reds and James O'Connor playing for the well, for the Hurricanes or vice versa, we've already seen in in small uh, small cases like Teleni Seo for the Waratahs has played 50 caps thereabouts for the Blues comes across because he's not getting game time over there, plays for the Waratahs, ends up starting. Um, e e e what what's the um, number eight for the Rebels? Yeah, Ekesau, I think. Yeah, so he's come across as well from New Zealand and wasn't getting game time, I think, in the Hurricanes. It is now starting for the Rebels, and he's performing really well as well. Both of those players are no longer currently eligible to play for the All Blacks. But if we, mm. in, we remove that sort of hindrance of not being able to be selected if they're still in super rugby i think it ends up going a long way in creates engagement by fans and it sort of starts to even out that talent yeah yeah okay well some good some good ideas and some good kind of uh questions coming up there uh let's jump quickly to a response from tc this season feels like a big step backwards for australian yes. rugby one from 12 against New Zealand sides last year, seven from 25. Brumbies look good. The rest look somewhere between mediocre and awful, disheartening. Look, I would say um, the disheartening teams have probably been the Force, the Reds, and the Tars. I think the Force from the general questions around what are they trying to do with the player management side of things and kind of the direction of the squad in a broader sense uh and then the reds and the tars in that the performances haven't matched the quality of the team that they actually do have um i think that the rebels have had moments throughout the season where they've played very well and a couple of a couple of good wins and a few disappointing performances whereas the brumbies have obviously been the shining lights i wouldn't say the situation is as dire as some people may feel that it is, but I can definitely understand why you would feel that the narrative um, is continuing yep. and, it, and it's been very, very challenging so far. Are you as disheartened as TC is? Uh, it depends what day of the week it is, really. Sometimes I sort of just accept the narrative that we're going to get pumped by the Kiwi sides and that's fine. Yes, you can see by my... My tips over the last few weeks that I put too much faith sometimes in the Aussie teams and think they're going to put in a good performance and upset the Kiwi sides and get pumped by 50. So that that always brings you down to earth a little bit. When I sort of considered that I thought the Waratahs were going to be really competitive this year and pushing for a top four finish and that we're now second last on the table, that that is disheartening. And I think a lot of fans in Super Rugby this year were expecting more from their sides. Um, and the fact that, as you said, those teams, the, mm. the Force, the Waratahs, and um, the Reds are just underperforming at the moment is hard to take for the Aussie fans because there isn't really a, a narrative as to why they should be performing as badly as they are. They should all theoretically be performing better other than maybe yep. the force. Yeah, and some of that that's injury in force and some of that is, I think, just the um, difficulties they've had with the squad, particularly with the changeover of coach coach and the like yep. so yeah look um there's there's again a lot to unpack within that and we're hopeful that we're going to be getting a, an interview with some of the um top uh people involved at some of the super rugby clubs around australia over the next couple of weeks to try and unpack some of those questions further so watch this space where we're just trying to get some um schedules aligned to see if that can happen yep
So either way, um, I think we're kind of finishing up there. We've spoken about all the different points. We had one question coming from Scrum really Bags to finish it off. Thank you so much. Oh, we've already we've already touched on that one. The Jake Gordon question. Um, the Jake Gordon on the flight. Yeah, yeah, you asked me Did that. Did I? Okay. Yeah, yeah, because we were talking about it near the end. But either way, why don't you just quickly say, do you think Jake Gordon will be making a flight to France? Uh, I think at the moment that it's it's neck and neck with Jake and Jake and Tate, uh, and it comes down to which one's going to be a better box kicker because I think that's the sort of gameplay that Eddie Jones wants to implement. And at the moment, Tate McDermott doesn't have a, a strong box kicking game um, or a strong sort of kicking game in general. So that probably puts Jake a little bit ahead of him at the moment. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I think it'll partly be down to which... Um team can lift their performances as well if the reds uh have a poor remainder of the 2023 season i think he is going to struggle to get on that plane so if the waratahs can step up then jake may well get ahead in the kind of uh picking order so Either way, that brings us to the end of the pod. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for sending your questions and comments in and for sticking with us this way through. It's been a lot of pleasure, a lot of fun, I should say, and our pleasure. Uh, Mitch, <laughs> mate, it's been fun. I'm going to be away for next week. And thank you for uh, being willing to delay this by one night. I was pretty sick, everybody, yesterday. So that's why this is coming out of daylight. My apologies. But Mitch, thanks for your patience and for covering for me for next week as well. Sorry. No problem. Yeah, we'll have a pot out next week. I'm still in talks at the moment to to lock the uh, co-host, but things are looking up. So uh, we'll be here next week back in, in on the regular channel. So for our social posts, let us know what's happening. I'll also be attending the Western Force Boratars game in Saturday next, but next Saturday night in Sydney. So um, if you are attending that game as well, keep an eye out for me. Come say hi if you do see me around the field. And uh, yeah, I'd love to have a chat and uh, get to meet a few of the fans. Yep, very, very keen. All right, mate, all the best. Go well. And, and I will see you in a week or so time. Awesome. Thanks, everyone.